Oh Marvel, how we loved you so. And then... Eat. My. Hammer! <laughs> Have you ever been a huge fan of something, expected it to last forever, then when it comes back around you don't even recognize it anymore? That's what Phase 4 was like for a lot of Marvel fans. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? I've made videos about the decline of the superhero genre, but I came into the YouTube game halfway through Phase 4 and didn't get a chance to review everything from that vomit inducer. So you know what? I'm going to rectify certain inequities. Let's do this shit, I said to myself. Let's revisit and review the Phase 4 projects I didn't do yet. And so I did. I sat down and rewatched all of Phase 4 minus the projects I already did videos on, and I absolutely hate myself now, but hey, it's over. I decided to split this project into two super reviews. This video will cover Phase 4's movie slate, and the second video will cover its television slate. I've included my previous Phase 4 reviews here for completionist's sake and their abridged versions, and all are timestamped for your convenience. I don't think it's any mystery that I feel Phase 4 was essentially dog water all the way through, but there was one highlight. Spider-Man No Way Home. Yeah, that's right. I'm not doing this in chronological order. Because I do whatever the fuck I want. This is the one piece of praise I'm giving to this phase of the MCU, so why not start out on a positive note? It's quite literally all downhill from here, so... Speaking of our boy Spidey, you ever wonder how he keeps MJ around? He's a superhero, yeah, but he's swinging around and probably sweating up a storm in those tights, so as a modern man, much like myself, I'm sure he uses cologne to keep MJ happy. That brings me to this video's sponsor, Scentbird, a fragrance delivery service created by a community of fragrance aficionados, beginners, and up-and-coming perfumers. I've always been a fragrance guy, and designer cologne can get really expensive, so I feel like once you find your scent, you kind of stick with it because it can get really costly. That's where Scentbird comes in, and I've become pretty smitten with their service. You just go to Scentbird's website, and the subscription service allows you to choose a designer fragrance of your choice, and you'll receive a 30-day supply. So you can try out a new fragrance every month until you find the one that's perfect for you. This is completely unisex. They have colognes and perfumes, so you have a ton of options, and they carry some heavy-duty names like Prada, Gucci, Versace, to indie labels like Heretic and Confessions of a Rebel. When you receive your fragrance, and it comes in this sexy little bag here, with an elegant little note telling you what the scent is going for and even the ingredients. I received a few for this and tried out each one. You just twist the top of the can and it's ready to go. Woo! You can also open it up to get a little more info and you can see it gets a pretty generous amount. I did get three and I really like the John Varvados one and not just because it's blue. I'd say it smells pretty masculine and sure as the day is long as soon as I look at the card that's exactly what they were going for so hit the nail right on the head. I tried the other ones too and they're definitely nice but seem specific like Brioni I'd wear to a wedding and Cyan was nice but it's a little light. But that's the whole point. You're not committing to anything. You're not spending hundreds of dollars on one bottle. You're getting a good amount at a low cost so you can find what you like. You can use my coupon code for 55% off at Scentbird. That means just a little over $7 for your first month and it ships to the USA and Canada. Timeline-wise, No Way Home was the fourth Phase 4 film, but because of the pandemic, all of those movies came out within just a few months of each other, between July and December 2021. So even though the first few were pretty much stinkers, Spidey's success with critics and audiences meant most people, myself included, felt Marvel was still in a pretty good position. Oh, how wrong I was. But still, I saw No Way Home multiple times in the theater and thoroughly enjoyed it at the time. So the big question is, now that the hype is gone, does it still hold up over a year later and watching it on a smaller screen? The answer is yes, mostly. I still regard it as one of the best movies the MCU's put out, especially if you want to compare it to what the MCU's dumping out now. I'm looking at you, Ant-Man 3. No, seriously, Ant-Man 3 would have been better if it was just Paul Rudd doing this in the mirror for two hours. You gonna take it? You gonna take that dick? You gonna take that dick? Huh? Back to the point, No Way Home is still mostly awesome. This movie was definitely meant to be seen with a crowd. Watching it at home with Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man's introduced, you can tell the film lingers on his introduction to allow for audience applause. <sighs> And it's awkward when you're just on your couch with your dog. And there are plot holes the size of the Grand Canyon. I can't deny that. But the film remains a banger because it gives a shit about its characters. And that means it cares about us, the audience. Something almost all of Phase 4 forgets about. Treating the viewer with respect. The story picks up immediately following the events of the second film, Spider-Man Far From Home, where Mysterio recorded a video before his death, lying and saying that Spider-Man is responsible for Mysterio's death. 
and revealing Peter Parker as the true identity of Spider-Man. Leaking the video to J. Jonah Jameson's Daily Bugle, meant to be a meta-joke as a ha-ha version of Alex Jones' Infowars, and Jameson proceeds to broadcast it to the entire world, leaving Mysterio with the last laugh and crop-dusting poor Pete. See ya, chump. <laughs> what the hell?! This has an immediate and negative impact on Peter's life and all of the people he's closest to, including MJ, his best friend Ned, Aunt May, and Happy Hogan. He's able to avoid criminal charges thanks to Daredevil's cameo, but Pete and his friends are all rejected from MIT because of the whole Spidey situation. And seeing his friends in distress, Peter swings by old Doctor Strange's abode and asks for help. Strange's solution? Have everyone forget Peter Parker is Spider-Man. We'll get to the plot holes, don't worry. Peter fucks up Strange's spell because he's a bumbling dumbass sometimes, and hijinks ensue. The altered spell was calling everyone in the multiverse who knows who Spider-Man is to their world. Strange contained it, but a few slipped through, and they just happen to be characters we the audience know from other iterations of Spidey on film, from villains to other versions of Spider-Man himself. The film succeeds in spite of its flaws, and it's largely due to how the writers make this about the characters. Criticism of Tom Holland's iteration of Spider-Man was, until this movie, about the fact he was basically Iron Man's sidekick. It was alluded to in Spider-Man Homecoming that tragedy befell Uncle Ben, and with Spidey already having his powers, we the audience assumed we were skipping over his origin tale. And let's not be fooled, we were skipping over his origin. Originally, anyway. When Spidey came to the MCU, origin fatigue had already set in. We had seen Spider-Man's origin twice in the Sam Raimi trilogy and the Amazing Spider-Man duology, and at the same time, Batman was getting another origin story told at the beginning of Batman vs. Superman. The general consensus was, do we really need to see Uncle Ben die again? When Tom Holland debuted as the wall crawler in Captain America Civil War, we got our answer. No, we're skipping past that. But Downey Jr.'s sidekick complaints persisted, rightfully so, and with No Way Home it was really great to see. Wow, okay, his entire MCU arc up to this point was his MCU origin story. Plot holes aside, this movie covered tremendous ground in a short amount of time without feeling rushed. It solved some major problems we had with this version of the character. The challenge with a fast-forwarded Spidey the MCU had set up was the audience missing out on aspects of the character we demand. Green Goblin was, and always will be, his greatest villain. Dr. Octopus was second on that list. And how could they possibly do all of that without retreading old ground? Willem Dafoe and Alfred Molina already played iconic versions of the characters. How do you do a Green Goblin Doc Ock arc that rivals that in a shortened time? With the contract situation between Sony and Marvel being up in the air after Far From Home, opportunity arose and they took advantage of it to solve these problems. A multiverse story allowed Willem Dafoe to come back, play his iconic role again, and add a whole new wrinkle to the character killing Aunt May and pushing Peter to become the Spider-Man we know and love. She was this universe's Uncle Ben, with her telling him with great power comes great responsibility. It established the Green Goblin as this Spider-Man's most impactful villain, and by the end when Spider-Man is swinging through the city in the suit he made for himself, it clicks. Holy shit, this was Spidey's origin. Rewatching this was such a pleasure. Still better than Ant-Man 3. Get it up in your vag with my dick. With my dick. Bringing Defoe and Molina back as these characters also mean we get to skip their origin story. We already know them, we already know who they are, so this was kind of an Avengers level meetup, where we get to see characters we already know play off each other for the first time. Clearly none of this was planned when Sony and Disney made the five picture Spider-Man deal back in 2015, but the opportunity was there when they re-signed for another Spider-Man MCU appearance, they seized it and took full advantage of it. It's lightning in a bottle, I'll be shocked if something this good happens again. All of this great character work means the member berries, and there are plenty of them, aren't the focus. I get that everyone loves the Super Mario Bros. movie, but that was basically just one giant commercial. It wasn't even a fucking movie. It exists to have you go, Oh, I remember. No Way Home has all kinds of that, but all of it is extra. It's all bonus stuff that adds to an already great, character-driven movie. I didn't show up so I could hear Willem Dafoe say his meme that will live forever. I came to see him be the Green Goblin, so when he does finally say it... You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. It's just that much extra for the fans to enjoy, instead of it being the reason you show up. They didn't have to, but they even completed Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man character arc for fuck's sake. And it didn't take away from Tom Holland's Spidey. When Garfield's Spidey saves MJ, and he tears up when asking her if she's okay, I sat back and just thought, holy shit, they even came full circle for him. 
It's simple, doesn't detract, it only adds. Shit, just typing this, I'm impressed with this movie all over again. And everyone in this movie brings their A game as far as acting, so I'll just touch on the highlights. Defoe is in top form as Green Goblin and is more menacing than he ever was. The scene when he's fighting Peter inside the condo, Peter hitting him in the face and the camera zooms in on Defoe cackling, gave me goosebumps. <laughs> It's brilliant acting, and that moment has become iconic in my eyes. It established Green Goblin as not just a legitimate threat, but made him the iconic Spider-Man villain for Tom Holland's version. Holland's Spider-Man was missing the Joker to his Batman, but this is where we found it. It was also great to see Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield back for the first time in years, and the film wisely uses them as integral pieces to the plot instead of just member berries. It's a fine line to toe. As a writer, I wouldn't want them to just be nostalgia bait, I'd want them to be part of the story, but you also can't have them overshadow Tom Holland's Peter. I think the filmmakers did a wonderful job with that. Alfred Molina as Doc Ock slides right back into his iconic role and it's like he's never left. The de-aging on him wasn't even noticeable, it's like he never aged a day. It's also nice to see Jamie Foxx get a second chance as Electro. Honestly, it's almost like a completely different version of the character, but that's for the best. The Amazing Spider-Man version of him was diarrhea. With all that said, I'm not going to pretend this movie doesn't have plot holes. Plot holes wide enough to drive a fucking truck through. And yeah, some of them are because of contract issues behind the scenes, but you can't use behind the scenes shit as an excuse. You have to take what you're given at face value when it comes to entertainment. This movie made me ask so many questions on my rewatch. If all the villains are here because they knew who Spider-Man was, why the fuck was Electro here then? He didn't know that in Amazing Spider-Man 2. Besides the fact that he's played by a big name actor, and Electro's a cool villain, I mean. Instead of asking Doctor Strange to make everyone forget Peter Parker as Spider-Man, why not just make everyone forget Mysterio? I don't know, there's a million fucking ways to go about doing this. The plot was clearly reverse engineered. The studios knew they wanted to have multiple Spider-Men and basically write a love letter to the Spidey IP and then figure out a way to make it work and went backwards. A multiverse story causes all kinds of problems no matter what. And it's also a go-to excuse to hand wave away any convenience or contrivance, especially when it's contradicted in later movies, like Multiverse of Madness explaining that an incursion will occur and destroy a universe if there's a person from another one there for too long. So the vulture arriving in Morbius's universe? Yeah, remember fucking Morbius? It's Morbius time. <laughs> that means that place is doomed. It's just thoughtlessness, carelessness, what have you. It's all annoying, but No Way Home still manages to succeed because of its reliance on rock-solid character writing. Tom Holland's Spidey grows into the one we know and love by the end of the movie. He's put through the ultimate test and carries on despite losing basically everything in his life. Spider-Man is one of the, if not the, greatest superheroes ever created. He stands as an example of the best of humanity, a hero who isn't perfect, who makes mistakes, who fails, but picks himself up again and moves forward and does the right thing. There's a reason his character is generationally loved, because who can't take away something positive from his story? That yes, you will have setbacks, things will not always be perfect, but you have to take responsibility all the same. No Way Home paints a portrait of Spidey that's endearing. And by the end of my revisit with the movie, I was pleased to report it doesn't just hold up, it's a damn good movie in spite of its flaws. With Spider-Man No Way Home reviewed, well, great. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> Black Widow was a way too late star vehicle for Scarlett Johansson in the title role. It's pretty sad that the first female-led MCU movie wasn't Black Widow. You know, the one everyone actually wanted. No, no, that went to Captain Marvel, the character that no one but actual comic fans knew about, that literally nobody was asking for, that succeeded because it was sandwiched between two of the biggest films in the MCU franchise. The film Black Widow takes place after the events of Captain America Civil War and came out six years, 11 movies, and one death of the title character too late for anyone to really give a shit. On top of that, it was kind of just silly as fuck, filled with plot conveniences that, unlike No Way Home, couldn't be covered up by being a character-driven story. Too much of it felt shoehorned in, which is yet another typical MCU problem at this point, trying to retcon and add in backstory to an already established universe, to make room for new characters who also just happen to have always been in the background, like their fucking smoke in Mortal Kombat 2. You're welcome for that reference. Captain Marvel's origin was a messy example of this now standard MCU trope. Same with the Eternals, which I'll get to, and for Black Widow, it's the Red Room and the rest of her family. 
The movie's story tries to balance showing us Natasha's past while integrating it into the present, which is not the present, since this movie takes place pretty far back in the MCU timeline. When you have to explain it like that, you should already know your movie won't be succeeding at much. We start with a flashback to introduce us to Natasha's surrogate family, who are working for a guy named Drakoff who runs the Red Room, a place where he trains young women to become Black Widows, basically a female super spy army. I'm just gonna call Drakoff Nice Guy Steve because it sounds stupid and he look stupid so yeah he takes natasha and her not sister against their will and they're sent into the black widow program we know that natasha escapes and defects to work for shield leaving her not sister behind and she blows up nice guy steve with a bomb but she apparently has the sad over it because his daughter was in the room when it detonated so if you've ever watched a movie in your life that means neither of them are dead sorry to spoil the obvious now we jump to the present that isn't actually the present where Natasha is on the run from General Ross because of her defect with Captain America after the events of Civil War. The younger, hotter, and blonder Black Widow replacement, played by Florence Pugh, is chasing a defecting Red Room Black Widow, who sprays Yolanda with lady blood, and she snaps out of her mind control agent all Black Widows are put under in the Red Room. She takes a vial of lady blood and sends it to ScarJo, hoping she'll help her younger, blonder, not sister free all the other Black Widows and put a stop to Nice Guy Steve's Red Room once and for all. The movie was, unfortunately, a failure on multiple fronts. Story, timing, special effects, box office, take your pick, and it either fell short or completely shit itself. The villain was an absolute joke. Talk about ruining a classic and could be awesome screen version of a character. Taskmaster here is really nothing like his, I mean, her comic counterpart, but comic accuracy is few and far between these days, so I'm not terribly offended with that. Taskmaster is the lame-ass silent villain that is clearly a man walking around most of the movie, a wannabe Winter Soldier, but when the helmet is removed for the face reveal, shocker, it's actually Nice Guy Steve's daughter. Nice Guy Steve's master plan's also just straight up fucking goofy. When you have your main character smash her head off a desk and it's supposed to be this triumphant moment where she one-ups the bad guy, you really need to revisit where this shit started going wrong. Maybe it's, I don't know, having your lead character kill hundreds if not thousands of people in an avalanche she caused so she could rescue one person? That could be one thing. The MCU doesn't care at this point about killing people who don't deserve it. In this instance, Natasha saved her not-father from a snowy mountain prison by causing said avalanche, leaving everyone else there to die including the people who work there. I guess we shouldn't care because they're all bad, because they're in jail. Besides her personal connection with her not-father, what actually makes him different than any of those other people? Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. This was the first movie of Phase 4 and there were reasonable complaints about the shitty CGI, which were shockingly bad in certain moments, especially since the film was supposed to be grounded with minimal effects at least compared to something like Endgame or Infinity War, and the film was delayed so more time was allowed for post-production. What we ended up with was meme-worthy shit like this. ScarJo is great and she'll be missed in her role as Black Widow. It's a shame she went out this way. I'm a really big fan of Florence Pugh and if she's the replacement B version of the character, I'm more than okay with that. But the most entertaining aspect of the film was the real-world fight between ScarJo and Disney, with her suing Disney because of a loss of back-end money. Back-end. <laughs> the movie was a simultaneous release in theaters and Disney+, Plus, meaning her contract was fucked since the box office was negatively impacted by the dual release. Disney came out with the worst bit of PR you can imagine by basically calling her a money-grubbing wench, which shockingly backfired, and they backpedaled almost immediately, and backed up the Brinks truck for her in the process. Ah, uh, Hollywood, where the filthy rich sue the ultra-wealthy. What a world we live in. Watching Thor Love and Thunder is like sucking a fart out of an ass. I fondly remember the days when I was excited for this movie. Then the rest of the MCU's Phase 4 kind of happened and my expectations plummeted. And yet, somehow, it still failed to scale even the lowest of bars. The movie doesn't give a shit about good storytelling and disregards any and all things from previous movies in order to tell its own story. I say disregards because the script uses a million fucking plot conveniences just to keep the movie moving forward. It feels like it's written by a five-year-old for other five-year-olds. Idiotic, misplaced, unfunny jokes are this movie's go-to. Like all the goodwill from Ragnarok has been taken advantage of. The movie feels inconsequential, has no bearing on the overall MCU, finds Thor rehashing the same old shit we've seen six fucking times already, 
and is paced about as well as a simp having sex for the first time. Oh yeah, and the special effects are ass. Initially I was annoyed and couldn't articulate my thoughts, only able to make like primal grunts. You know when you just get like real rage, like, like you just, dude. But I think I can articulate what's wrong with this movie now. Yes, an articulate way of describing this film is, it fucking sucks. Most everything about it. No, it's not just me being fed up with watching actors walk around against a green screen with obvious CGI surroundings during every single scene. No, it's not just that I'm tired of superhero films increasingly appearing like they're off an assembly line. No, I'm not just tired of bait and switch bullshit. I'm tired of terrible fucking writing. I'm tired of it. The movie opens with the first of its two in total good moments. With Christian Bale's gore comforting his daughter as they both lay dying of starvation and dehydration on some desert world. He prays to his god, whoever the fuck, for help and receives nothing. This is the movie's few bright spots. Christian Bale is the shit. He acts his ass off in this movie and, as he usually does, gives it his all. Then the shit writing comes in immediately. Nothing annoys me more than plot contrivances. Well, after Gore's daughter dies, an oasis appears near him and he finds his god he was praying to just sitting there, eating grapes and shit with some flower folk. There's a random dead body, and the god conveniently tells Gore that the random body was a guy out to kill him, and the guy could have done it too, because the spooky black sword lying next to him has the ability to slay gods. Gore's like, hey, would have been nice if you helped me. You're my god, I devoted myself to you. And the god's like, fucking nope, I don't help losers. Then the god gets mad that Gore doesn't like him being a dick, and in a tussle, Gore grabs the sword that conveniently happens to be laying there, that conveniently can kill gods, that the god conveniently told Gore about before telling him to get fucked, and Gore kills the god. See where I'm going here? This is one of a thousand plot contrivances that just absolutely kills my fucking soul. And don't worry, I'll go over some more to give you a laugh. Even if you laugh once, that's one more time than you'd laugh at this joke of a fucking movie. Next, we find Thor where we left him off in Endgame. Fucking around with the Guardians, but just like I predicted in the previous video, they are in it for about five minutes before Taika finds a reason for them to fuck off. You see, they find out that Lady Sif is in dire need of help, and the Guardians are like, but there are a lot of people that need help. You go! And thus, the contrived reason for Thor separating from them is complete. I remember when fans thought that the next Thor would be an exciting romp with this crew, but somehow we all forgot that Taika likes to disregard whatever came before, so anything cool can get fucked in the name of screaming goats. <laughs> And giant goats! Oh, look at those! They are wonderful! Yes, they are. They also scream quite a lot. Haha. <laughs> nice. Too bad this one-time joke is used about 80,000 times throughout the movie. Thor finds Lady Sif, and what could be a heartfelt scene between longtime friends and warriors is flatlined and undercut by a shitty joke. Just like every scene in this goddamn movie. Sif tells Thor about gore. And yeah, the main characters in this movie are two people named Thor, one Gore, and another Korg. Yep, and informs Thor that new Asgard is going to be attacked next. After a dozen or so additional jokes fall flat with no one in my theater laughing, the movie jumps to Jane Foster, who's apparently dying of stage 4 cancer. Thankfully, Taika has retroactively decided that Thor told Mjolnir to protect her during some flashback scenes of Jane and Thor's life together before they started fighting and it all fell apart. Yeah, what story are you gonna tell? This one, right? Not the part about how I pay all the fucking bills! So it calls to her and she fucks off to New Asgard to retrieve it. Thor and Korg arrive right after Gore arrives and, uh, Mighty Thor is there too. So yeah, Thor, Thor, Gore, and Korg are all here. Beautiful. Apparently, Mjolnir can reform when it feels like it. Plot convenience? That would have been convenient at any point during Ragnarok, Infinity War, and Endgame. But fuck me, what do I know? Apparently, Lady Thor is immediately as badass as regular Thor despite his thousands of years of battle experience because... Girl power. King Valkyrie helps out or whatever, but she's basically here because she's having sex with the director. I mean, <laughs> she's super important to the plot. And we all know she's known as King instead of Queen because she's a strong female character. But totally not because the filmmakers are trying to pander. Because we all know the only way to validate a feminine character is to give her decidedly masculine traits and titles. 
Traits and titles that are deemed toxic, but only if possessed by males. So anyway, Gore kidnaps some kids so that Thor will try and find him because villain reasons. Thor, Thor, Korg, and Valkyrie decide they'll need help from all the gods to stop Gore. Are you keeping up with the names? So they seek help from Zeus in some place where all the gods hang out and fuck each other. Thor gets stripped to his bare ass while the female characters are completely desexualized because the MCU has a funny sense of what equality is, and to stop Gore from killing gods, Thor kills Zeus with his own lightning bolt weapon and steals it. Yep, that's basically it. Korg gets killed too, or so I wish. Now, there's an after credits scene that shows Zeus isn't dead, but Thor blows a fucking hole through Zeus's chest, so for the story narrative, it was safe to assume he was done for. The funniest part of the whole thing is how dumb this shit is. We also find out that Mjolnir is granting Natalie Portwoman the power of Thor, but she's also still dying. So what the fuck is it even doing? At least in the comics, it made it clear that possessing the power of Thor stopped Jane from dying. If she lost her power, that's when the cancer would kill her. Here, the mechanics of how it all works is vague because we just need to move the fuck on and look at the pretty images and chuckle at the shitty jokes. Thor and the Screaming Goat crew go on the next MacGuffin chase, and there's a scene that could have been a great character moment between Thor and Jane, where they reconcile their love for each other that's undercut, once again, by attempts at humor. The crew arrive at the Shadow Realm, or wherever the fuck Gore's hanging out, in an honestly cool concept where everything is black and white, and Lady Thor conveniently stumbles upon a fully drawn-out concept of Gore's plan to steal Stormbreaker and utilize the Bifrost to get to his ultimate MacGuffin destination. Eternity, a place that will grant any one wish of the first person who enters it. Thor apparently knows about this place. Wouldn't that have been convenient to go to when Thanos attacked? Or shit, even after Thanos won? Like, wish Thanos away, wish the Infinity Stones away, or hell, just wish the return of everyone Thanos killed. Once Lady Thor finds out Gore's plan, instead of using Stormbreaker to just go to eternity themselves and wish Gore away or wish for literally anything to save the universe, she just throws the fucking axe. Why? Because the story has to continue. Duh. They fight, Thor recalls Stormbreaker, and because Valkyrie gets injured during a fight to save the galaxy, Jane apparently decides they need to leave instead of stopping Gore. Yep. Then, as they're leaving through the Bifrost, Gore grabs Stormbreaker and Thor loses his grip. Yes, that happens too. Gore, who isn't anywhere as powerful as Thor, hangs onto the axe and Thor loses his grip. Why? Because the story needs to continue. Duh. Now that Gore has access to the Bifrost and can go to eternity at any time and wish them all dead, in this dire need for a sense of urgency, they all decide to chill and lick their wounds back on Earth. Why? Because the movie doesn't give a shit. Duh. Jane's dying and Thor's like, Don't use Mjolnir again. It's killing you and you'll totally be dead if you do it one more time. And then Valkyrie's like, Hey Thor, I know we initially went to get an entire army of gods to fight Gore, but now Jane and I are hurt so you should probably go do this all by yourself. And Thor's like, I think you're right, and maybe in a moment of need, Jane will sense it and decide to use Mjolnir one more time to save me even though it means she'll die, so then she'll be the hero of my movie. And Valkyrie's like, Sounds awfully convenient to me. You should probably definitely go do that. And Thor's like, Yeah, I'm gonna fucking go do that. Thor goes back to the Shadow Realm and frees the kids, and then gives them all the power of Thor so he has his own little army. Wait, 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 wait. Did Thor have this ability the entire time? Was it Zeus's thunderbolt that allowed him to do that? If so, how'd he know it could? Awfully fucking convenient. If he's had this ability the whole time, might have been pretty helpful at any point in time in the MCU's history, huh? This scene's perfect because the five-year-olds that are his little army really represent the writing style of this movie. Childish. The movie wraps up with the obvious. Natalie Portwoman shows up to save Thor's ass because he can't do it alone, as she destroys the Necrosword and dooming herself to death via the cancer and died on a Tuesday. But not before saying the cringiest shit you've ever heard in your life. My favorite feature of the movie telling the audience how to see the character instead of letting things speak for themselves. Nothing like some good on-the-nose pandering to satisfy the mouth breathers. 
Even Gore gets in on the cringe with some blunt dialogue stating, I'm dying, as, well, he's dying. I'm dying. The movie is basically bookended by the second of the only two good scenes in the film, once again featuring Christian Bale, who I can't speak highly of enough, as he decides to wish for his daughter back instead of killing the gods. It's well acted, but just showcased another plot contrivance. Gore wanted to kill the gods because his wouldn't save him at the beginning of the film. Since he can obviously be shown something powerful enough to change his mind, wouldn't Thor arriving to save the kids prove to him that not all gods are bad? And please don't be a dumbass and use the necro sword as an excuse. Even if it corrupted him, it was already destroyed and he still went into eternity to wish all the gods dead. So get fucked if you're going to use that. This one can't be explained away, it's just more shit. Anyway, Jane dies in Thor's arms in a scene that once again could have been good if given any chance to breathe, but much like the rest of the film, it's edited like ass and poorly paced so we just move right the fuck on. Thor takes on the responsibility of raising Gore's daughter, and the movie thankfully ends. There's so much that went wrong in this movie, what I've talked about so far doesn't even begin to cover it. All this movie did was simply prove that Ragnarok was a special film, something that was needed at the moment to revitalize the character, but audiences are already tired of Thor playing second fiddle to others and basically being mocked and made a fool of in his own films. I think it's safe to say that the majority of people's favorite iteration of Thor was in Avengers Infinity War, where he was able to be the badass god we expect him to be. For me, the scene that stands out most in that entire film was when he arrives in Wakanda and yells, Bring me Thanos. My theater absolutely erupted when that happened. Then to revert back to him basically being a punchline, right after being made a fool of as Fat Thor in Endgame? Love and Thunder is paced like dog shit because Waititi can't let a single scene be serious. The best of the MCU has balanced comedy with drama. This doesn't even try. That funny scene with Matt Damon and Ragnarok is done once again, but just goes fucking on and on. And then they bring in Melissa McCarthy to just do her shtick and yell and scream. Oh my god, I almost forgot about that. I wish I fucking did. Since Taika clearly doesn't give a shit about writing a coherent storyline, he's basically making a comedy film. So it should be funny, right? Since Love and Thunder is anything but funny, what are we even fucking watching? My audience barely chuckled at a few jokes. Ragnarok this was not, despite Marvel trying and failing to replicate it. There's nothing quite like a running joke throughout a movie that isn't even funny the first time you hear it. Uh, Jane is trying to come up with a catchphrase as Thor. Oh my god, this is... Shit! It is a table of shit! A talented cast, the biggest budget you could ask for, and Guns and Fucking Roses couldn't even save this one. In conclusion, Thor Love and Thunder is... Keanu Reeves taking his shit. <laughs> Alright, next up is Shang-Chi, which is definitely a movie. Honestly, this one is kind of slept on. It's not incredible by any stretch, but it's also not the worst movie the MCU's ever put out. It's fine. I think I ranked it a C- in passing in one of my other videos. After a rewatch, yeah, I'll stick with the C- ranking. All things considered, take it as high praise. Like any good MCU origin story, it starts out with a flashback to Shang-Chi's dad trying to lay his mom. I'm gonna put my dick in! Whoops, <laughs> wrong movie again, my bad. Nah, but Shang-Chi, or Sean, according to his need for Americans to pronounce his name right, is the son of a kinda mortal dude. Kinda, because he isn't really immortal, but he has possession of the Ten Rings, which grant him immortality and wacky cool comic book powers. He goes to Magic Misty Forest that holds Magic Misty creatures, but he's stopped by some fine-looking lady and they dance fight in cringe fashion before falling in love. Old Dad leaves his life behind to live with her and raise his kids, but Wifey is murdered by his rivals. So he takes control of the Ten Rings again, fucks them up real good for what they've done, and retakes the lead position in his Mario Kart gang. It's kind of a classic trope, powerful man meets woman who soothes him, something bad happens to her so he seeks out revenge and becomes more powerful than ever. One of the kids decides to stay by his side while the other wants nothing to do with it, that one being Shang-Chi, our main character. If you've ever seen a movie before, you can see where it goes. But I'd say this movie's propped up in some of the same ways Spider-Man No Way Home was, where the characters are interesting enough that it can get you through some of the lame paint-by-numbers aspects of this story. For whatever reason, Aquafina's here, and she's terribly miscast. 
but she's miscast in everything she's in because she shouldn't be in anything. Other than her, though, the acting's pretty solid across the board. Tony Leung as Shang-Chi's powerful father is exceptional and gives an elevated, nuanced performance for a big-budget superhero movie. Simu Liu as Shang-Chi is also pretty serviceable. He's witty when he needs to be and is an outstanding martial artist. Unsurprisingly, the movie shines during its action sequences, with a fight on the bus standing out as well as the battle on the side of the skyscraper. We are let down at the end though with the typical guy against green screen versus CGI monster that, for whatever reason, Hollywood can't let go of. For all the arguments against someone like me when I say MCU projects are mostly bad post-Endgame, the one I hear the most besides You're an ist or ism for criticizing this movie TV show by dumbasses is All MCU fans think a project needs to be as big as Infinity War. No, we fucking don't. I'm literally telling you, right now, a smaller scale story is what we're fucking asking for. Stop making everything a world-ending threat. The two times post-Endgame any project has been good whatsoever is when the characters were the focus and not some idiotic world-ending villain. We don't need every movie to be over-the-top like a good old J.R. WrestleMania commentary. The character of Shang-Chi is also highly upgraded from his comic book counterpart. Again, comic accuracy isn't even a thing anymore anyway, so whatever. They had to make him powerful enough to actually become an Avenger, so I'm all good with what they've done. C-. minus. And we've arrived at the Eternals. This movie managed to not be the worst of Phase 4, but its quality still left me Stifler level baffled. Oh my god, what the fuck is going on? This movie just fucking sucked. Besides the absolute joke it became when Angelina Jolie said the diversity of the cast was going to save lives. Yes, seriously, this is almost as funny as someone unironically saying celebrities losing their blue check on Twitter was going to lead to deaths. It was just poorly executed in every conceivable way. The problem started when directing duties were handed over to Chloe Zhao, not because of her ability to direct big-budget action movies, but because she had recently won an Academy Award, and this movie was supposed to be about a family, so the hopes were that she'd be able to bring out the best in its characters. And, yeah, she checked a diversity box. Unfortunate for her, as that is. And again, I'm not bringing this up, it's what they were talking about. The marketing, the interviews, all they ever talked about with this film was how diverse it was. Out of any movie in recent memory, this is the one that puts an exclamation mark on how not to do that. Emphasizing an ethnicity quota over actually giving attention to telling a decent story is basically Eternal's forte. It's overlong, bogged down with way, way too many characters. The timeline and pacing become obnoxious and confusing. It creates major plot holes in the MCU for no fucking reason at all. And worst of all, it's just boring. The Eternals are powerful beings created by even more powerful beings called Celestials, big-ass CGI godlike things that live in space and shit. The Eternals are created to fight generic CGI creatures called Deviants. And yes, there are plot twists and turns that are just... whatever. Each Eternal is basically a D-list rip-off version of Wake Cooler Heroes from the Marvel and DC universes. Each one exists to fill a tiny role in the team. One communicates with the Celestial, one can manipulate humans, so basically like Professor X or something. One can fly and shoot eye lasers, so basically Superman. One can run real fast, so basically The Flash. One is like Beast, so he's basically just a tech guy. You fucking nerd! And one can shoot sparkles out of his fingers. If you want to know just how bloated a cast we have and how forgettable these characters are, the finger sparkles dude is introduced and then disappears for like an hour and a half. And when he reappeared, I completely forgot he'd even left. As much as the film wants you to be attached to these characters or empathize with them, it's just fucking ridiculous. They're cardboard cutout cliches. Did you know the Flash ripoff is deaf? First superhero disability representation. As long as you blatantly ignore Daredevil and Professor X, I mean. The film also has to explain why the fuck these heroes have been on Earth forever, but didn't help in the battle against Thanos. So basically it's hand waved away because it's dumb as shit. The answer they provide? They couldn't. Wow. Neat. The film's bloated runtime is filled out by bouncing back and forth between the present and flashbacks trying to tell the story of these boring ass characters. It's a big mess, but if you're watching this, you've probably seen this piece of shit and know about the Celestial they stopped from being born within the center of the Earth, which would have destroyed the planet if it was allowed to. We're left with the giant Celestial hand sticking out of the ocean, which is insane, right? 
Well, no worries. It hasn't been referred to or spoken of since in any MCU project, except a fleeting glance at a newspaper mentioning it in fucking She-Hulk of all projects. This movie is, without a doubt, Keanu Reeves taking a shit. You make sure that you use your body to block us from anybody who would be coming in that theater to do us harm. This is a sickness! Oh boy, I'm gonna catch some flack for this one. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is a mess of a film that tries to do too many things at once and can only muster doing one of them well, which is honoring Chadwick Boseman. The film shines in a few moments, particularly the scenes bookending the film, and hinges on the hope that those scenes can manipulate you into thinking the other parts of the movie are good, or at least hoping you'll forgive them. But what's left is an unfortunately clumsy and shallow film that was clearly made with the best intentions, but can't get out from under the large shadow cast by our fallen hero, and can't escape the horrible writing that continues to plague the MCU's Phase 4. Is this Eternals level bad? No, not really. But it's Black Panther and it shouldn't be like this. I'd be interested to know what the original script was like before Bozeman passed, because what we're stuck with now is a film that tries to A. Honor T'Challa B. Build up a new lead character C. Introduce and establish a new antagonist D. Introduce another new hero E. Try and nudge the MCU as a whole forward at least a little bit. Each of these things could take an entire movie, but we shove all of these requirements into this and what do we get? A disjointed mess, trying to do so many things in one film that you end up with a bloated runtime that despite trying to accomplish so much, becomes a snooze fest at its best. This is from a person who enjoyed the original film in spite of its flaws. This doesn't hold a candle to that movie. It's clear that Black Panther isn't just a mantle to pass down for us as an audience. T'Challa is our hero. You can't just put anyone in there. Did it happen in the comics? Yeah, sure. But Ironheart was in the comics too. <laughs> The plot is full of idiotic choices and conveniences that break the film under even the slightest scrutiny. The people of Wakanda should probably be the bad guys of the movie when you take their choices into consideration, which in reality is the typical MCU Phase 4 trope. Again, we'll get to that. I mean, seriously, the Wakandans won't even help out their neighboring countrymen, but they are the most righteous people in the entire world. And our replacement main character simply isn't built or fit to lead a movie of this size in either performance or physical frame. And the antagonist of the film is... God, what a joke. And I still can't pronounce his name right because it's spoken eight different ways in the movie. Well, Pan. No, my name is Pam. Are you saying Pan or Pam? Pam. 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 Pan. With an There's M. There's a D on the end. Riri Williams, a.k.a. Ironheart, is at least not as insufferable as their comic book counterpart, but that's not saying much. She ends up being yet another character no one really asked for that's a B-list version of an A-list hero. From the audience score to critic reviews, I get that you're supposed to like this film. It definitely feels like you're not allowed to criticize it, but I'm not going to just let things slide that I see with my own two eyes. Much like my Rings of Power video getting demonetized, my mouth sure gets me in trouble. Millions of people, in person and in virtual form, have told me, you're the worst, shut the fuck up. Who cares what you believe? Quit speaking, you, but I'm gonna do it anyway. The movie starts off with Shuri trying to save her brother who is dying from an unspecified illness off screen. She's unsuccessful, and the next several minutes of the film are spent honoring our beloved and fallen hero. It's well done, it hit me in the feels, man. The meta-ness is a little too much though, and I wonder if they could have done this differently, because he's essentially suffering in silence and doesn't ask for help with his unspecified illness. Kind of like Bozeman apparently did in real life, not telling anyone about his cancer. It felt a little too much like the real world seeping into the movie when the characters discuss it. Whether it was right or wrong, the respect they have for him comes out on the screen. Next, the Queen of Wakanda meets some folks at the UN to explain to them that they won't be letting anyone get their hands on vibranium because only Wakandans know best. This sounds an awful lot like the weird moral ineptitude that Marvel has been pushing with its characters since Phase 4 started, like trying to make Wanda sympathetic despite her enslaving an entire town and killing dozens of people across the multiverse. If my suspension of disbelief was a bridge, it would have snapped by now. We then hilariously jump right to a U.S. ship plundering the depths of the ocean where they've discovered more vibranium, and they're using a vibranium detector to find it. What an incredible MacGuffin. What an incredibly creative name. What a coincidence they found vibranium right after Wakanda said they wouldn't be giving any up. 
Then Namor, 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 whatever, and the Not Atlanteans attack the ship and provide an untimely end to everyone aboard. Turns out the Not Atlanteans have access to vibranium just like the Wakandans, and they don't want their underwater world to be discovered, so they want to off the inventor of the MacGuffin. I mean, of the vibranium detector. And so the plot is off and running. Unfortunately, it's built on an incredibly shaky foundation. Did I say shaky? I meant it's a 9 on the Richter scale, and it's fallen into the ocean. See, if the US had a ship out there, and they discovered vibranium, then it's too late. Who cares if they have another detector? They already know where the vibranium is based on where the ship is. But no, we have to, one, introduce multiple new characters, and two, have a reason to make a movie. Namor, Namor, blah, 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 sneaks up on Shuri and her mother, and he tells them, Hey, you have to help me find the scientist who made the vibranium machine. And they're like, Get fucked! And he's like, Nah, I won't actually, because I'll wage some kind of war on you if you don't get her. I don't want the above world to know about my below world, so my people can't go get her. So Shuri and the woman from The Walking Dead decide they're going to go to America and find the scientist. Turns out it's Mary Sue, I mean Riri Williams, who has no explanation about why she's a hyper-intelligent 19-year-old who seems to be smarter than any person on Earth, but here she is all the same. The only piece of credit I'll give here is that this movie at least doesn't shit on the memory of Iron Man, like the other movies and shows have done to our legacy heroes. No one up to this point has escaped it. Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, all have been crapped on in order to make their unlikable replacements look cool for the awakened society at large. Did not go to law school and rack up six figures in student loans to become a vigilante that is for billionaires and narcissists and adult orphans for some reason. If a billionaire narcissist saved the entire universe, what does that make a drunkard like you? We escaped that kind of BS here without nary a mention of Stark. Thankfully. But Riri is, by and large, a Mary Sue, no doubt about it. She's incredible at everything, smarter than everyone, seems like even smarter than Shuri, because of course she is. They work around her supervillain origin story from the comics, where she begs her teacher to victimize her and tell her she can't do something so that she can prove her teacher wrong. Oh wait. I ain't feel no detective from no CIA, I made that from a metallurgy class. The professor said I'd never be able to do it. Never mind. During their escape, Walking Dead Girl kills a bunch of innocent policemen who are just trying to do their jobs. Yeah, again, remember when I said it's hard to take Wakandans seriously as the good guys? You're a, you, uh, you're like a bad person. This is how Marvel works now. These are our main characters, so they are good guys. Anyone who is chasing them are bad guys. It's that simple. Just don't think about it, okay? Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. Walking Dead Girl fights not Atlanteans who show up even though Namor, Namor, nah nah, doesn't want his people to be discovered or seen by the surface world. So, of course, they get seen by humans. So wait, they're here now, so I guess they don't care about being seen by humans? So they could have just gotten Riri by themselves. So why send the Wakandans? Wait, wait, wait. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. And then Shuri demands to meet Namor and Mara and goes off with them along with Riri. And yeah, I kind of laugh in my head every time I say her name. Shuri meets Namor and asks him his origin story for the audience's benefit. He's a mutant, you see, and calls himself the boy without love, even though he had a mother who loved him for decades before she died of old age. Shuri asks him the tough questions, like do not Atlanteans use a toilet or does pee and poop just float around everywhere? And he waxes philosophical. One question that I get asked a lot, and I think it's an important question, is is it okay to shit your pants? And I think we have to ask ourselves, firstly, is it okay to shit? And the answer to that is yes, of course it is okay to shit. Then he starts talking about the plight of his people. I get young men coming up to me all the time, and their pants are covered in poo-poo, and most of it has usually come from their own butt, and it's a travesty. It's very upsetting. Sometimes they've come hundreds of miles just to see me, and they're covered in shit. Then he brings her further down the depths, and she sees a really lame underwater city. Honestly, you don't see much. It comes off kind of silly. Aquaman did this far, far better. And even the Gungan city from Phantom Menace 23 years ago looked better than this. Because it looks so lame and forgettable, it doesn't give off the sense of power the film tries to make you believe it has, either. Next, T'Challa's girlfriend finally shows up to remind you to be sad about Chadwick Boseman, and she goes undercover to get Shuri and Riri back. She kills a not-Atlantean in the process, and Shuri is like, Wait, this will be an act of war. Let me save her. 
And T'Challa's girlfriend is like, no, don't do that. We need the plot to move. So Namor finds the dead not Atlantean is like, the fuck you did, and attacks Wakanda in some goofy ass trite way and kills the queen, then flies off because it's always a brilliant idea to piss someone off, then let them regroup. So then Shuri's like, the fuck you did, and uses her own MacGuffin to recreate another MacGuffin. I mean, her magic machine that creates the magic herb, so she can become Black Panther and duke it out with Namor, Namor, Mamabu. The script tries to make us question whether Shuri will seek ultimate revenge or not, but come on, seriously. They come up with what sounds like a cool way to trap Namor, but then it turns out to be just a room on a ship with heaters. For real. When I saw this in the theater, I chuckled a little. That's the best they came up with. It's so anticlimactic. The camera zooms up in awe to fucking space heaters. Wakandans and not Atlanteans duke it out. Riri is flying around in a suit straight out of the Nintendo 64 era of graphics, and Shuri beats Namor and makes him yield. I mean, after he full-on impales her with his spear, then she's just totally fine. This was a few eye-roll-inducing moments back-to-back -back in the theater. They call a truce by basically retreading T'Challa's moment of clarity with Zemo from Captain America's Civil War, and we move on. The movie's bookended by a nice montage of T'Challa as Shuri sits alone, mourning her brother. And honestly, it's emotionally impactful. And manipulative. I'm not going to forget that the rest of the movie I just saw was ridiculous just because it ends on an emotionally impactful moment that had nothing to do with what I just saw. But that does lead us into discussing what the film does well. And very well, actually. Which is honoring T'Challa and, in the meta, Chadwick Boseman. Shuri, played by Letitia Wright, is the focus of these scenes and brings a level of maturity we did not see from her both as a character and as an actress in her other MCU appearances. In fact, I think I was one of the few people who thought she was an incredibly annoying and unlikable character in the other films. But here she brings some real chops that I can appreciate. Angela Bassett really nails it as Queen Ramonda. She puts on a tour de force and goddamn, she is legit in this. And finally, Tenacha Huerta as Namor. I'm sorry, this dude was awful. Maybe it was the writing, you can't really tell sometimes, but he was horrible in this role. Okay, clearly the writing had something to do with it, but it was a seriously rough performance and the character came off as stupid. His lines were delivered in cringe fashion. There were constantly moments where you didn't know what kind of emotion he was trying to portray. And it absolutely was not meant to be a deceptive character trait either. It was just silly acting. There have been comments about his physicality and appearance, but I didn't really care about that. I read somewhere that it was a specific look they were going for, and he looks like a bodybuilder who's in bulking mode. I'm not here yelling, Put that cookie down! I think he would have looked better as a cut Namor, but it is what it is. Do you, boo-boo. But Namor himself is poorly translated from comic to film here. I don't know how someone at some point didn't go, Hey, I know he has wings on his feet, but like, it looks stupid as shit. Can we just not? You know how they didn't have wings on Captain America's helmet and they just painted them on? Figure something else out to make him fly. Because it really does look stupid, and they proudly display it during his introduction too. It just looks embarrassingly bad. Inept writing that carried over from the original Black Panther harms this film more than anything else. Like a great script can transcend bad acting, a great performance and great characters can sometimes transcend a bad script. But this? What do we do with this? We're left with no one to carry this film. No one here is anywhere close to Bozeman. The film was destined for failure because of it. In my opinion, you can't ignore it and you can't lean into it too much because then it's just about the ghost of a fallen hero. The film is stuck and it stays where it is, trapped in the MCU narrative while spinning its wheels unable to move forward in any meaningful way. It's a poor way to cap off Phase 4 that's already dishearteningly horrible. Messy storytelling, seriously goofy CGI, and a plot sitting in a foundation of pudding makes for another MCU shit show. But unlike Doctor Strange or Thor Love and Thunder, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Seeing Doctor Strange 2 in the Multiverse of Madness was the equivalent to running into an angry sea bass after ordering a meal. You gonna eat that? <laughs> I just wanted to have a good time. I paid good money, but in the end, it was the ultimate Rick Roll. Doctor Strange 2 is an absolute mess, and anyone who's followed its up and down production schedule or listened to what the star himself has said, you can see why. So this is your movie? Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, that's part of the problem. Is There's it? a lot is of it? stuff going on in it. It's like, well, I do, Everyone's I, I do in have it. a character. I can, is, is it working? You know? Yeah. Well, Benedict, the movie is out, and the answer to that question is no. No, you do not have a character arc. This movie isn't Doctor Strange's movie. Remember when Civil War had a ton of characters, but it still found a way to make it Steve Rogers' story? How it pushed his character forward? Yeah, there's no equivalent of that here. I honestly can't believe some of the praise this movie's getting, and some of the hoops people are jumping through to excuse why people like myself didn't enjoy it. I really, really wanted this movie to be good, because Phase 4 of the MCU has towed the line between utter failure and complete disaster, with one incredible film holding the whole thing up. But it's clear at this point that the MCU is slowly but surely destroying its past in order to prop up its future. Anything suggesting that it's honoring its legacy seems to be more of a sham than anything else. Characters are getting rolled over to make new ones look better, and this movie continues that trend. The acting? A saving grace. The directing? Misplaced. The writing? Possibly the worst the MCU's seen. The effects? Some great, some straight from the early 2000s. Overall, This is shit! This is a table of shit! Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness's story finds the good doctor trying to hide a new character named America Chavez from the Scarlet Witch. America's power set is that she can jump through the multiverse, and Wanda wants to take those powers so that she can be with her children that we last saw in the WandaVision TV show. You know, the children who didn't actually exist. People can forgive lacking visuals, so-so acting, and choppy editing most of the time as long as the script and story of a film is good. But without a good script, those issues become more glaring because there's nothing to make up for them. And holy god, this movie's writing is absolutely atrocious. The studio began reshoots for this movie in late 2021, mere months before it was set to come out. And that's pretty typical, especially for an MCU movie. But then we found out it was going to go on for over six weeks, far beyond what's normal for reshoots and pickups. The result is clear as day. You can see it in the shifting of Doctor Strange's wig line. They must have reshot nearly 60 to 70 percent of this movie. Well, it didn't work. The antagonist of the film, Wanda Maximoff, is seeking her kids that didn't actually exist. One, because children are probably cheaper to get than Paul Bettany, I'm sure. And two, because whatever. That's what the writers want. Regardless of the fact that it makes her character look stupid and the script has to keep giving her free passes for horrible things she's done or is doing. She put an entire town under her spell and left the citizens begging her to just kill them. If you won't let us go, just let us die. But according to Doctor Strange, she set things right, so it's okay. How did she set things right? By just leaving? Very heroic. Now she's in possession of something called the Dark Hole that she's utilizing to try and capture America Chavez. So she can use America's power to travel the multiverse and find her kids in an alternate reality. And the Dark Hole has its grip on her, so that's why she's going extra evil and saying ridiculous things in this film like, You made me kill these people after obliterating the sorcerer's stronghold of Kamartage. It's like we're missing a massive chunk of story that could explain why this character is dumb as shit now. Why isn't she seeking out Vision? White Vision's still alive in the world. World, why not go after him? The script knows how absurd this is and has Doctor Strange point out the obvious. What about the Scarlet Witch in the other universe who's the actual mother of these children? And she doesn't have an answer because there is no rational answer. Here's a tip. Pointing out your stupids doesn't mean they are now not stupid. It's stupid. The Darkhold might be why she went on a killing spree, but all it did was amplify the idiocy that was already there not change her goals. And what about our main character, Doctor Strange himself? Well, here's the thing. There's so much going on with the shockingly brief runtime that Strange himself seems almost like another cog in the MCU machine rather than a full character. During the movie, I was reminded a lot of how he was used in Spider-Man No Way Home as kind of a tool to move the story around and get the plot moving in the direction they needed, except not done as well. Not even close. This movie definitely has his name in the title, but at no point does it feel like his movie. There are hints of who he is here and there, but there's no arc for him whatsoever in this. The film touches on a few things. Yep, he still loves Christine, and he gets cucked right at the beginning of the movie. Trust me, I hate that word too, but it is what it is. And he still doesn't have her at the end. He's not the Sorcerer Supreme at the beginning of the film, and he still isn't at the end. He gets a third eye from using the Darkhold and screaming at the end of the movie. Then immediately in the post-credits, he's totally fine. The film has absolutely zero progress for Strange as a character. The movie feels as episodic as the MCU has ever felt, as and then storytelling as it ever has been. There's no character development in his own film that's any deeper than what we've seen in supporting roles for Strange. It's insane to me that there's less to say about him in his own movie than there is about Scarlet Witch. At least there's something there to complain about with her, but the only real conclusion I can come to for how I feel about Strange is that, well, at least he's in the movie. 
and these are just problems with the main characters. As far as actual events, I can't believe that people were paid millions of dollars to write what I saw on screen. You could feel the hasty rewrites as they were unfolding. The movie opens with Strange having a dream where he and America Chavez were running from a monster. And shortly after, he runs into them for real. And she tells him that people's dreams are actually of alternative versions of themselves from other realities. But she is the only America Chavez in the entire multiverse. Isn't it convenient that out of an infinite number of versions of himself that he could have seen in his dream, that he happened to see the one that was with the literal one and only Miss Chavez, who he was going to meet not five minutes later in the movie? Later in the film, once the two of them have passed into another universe, Strange and Chavez walk by a store that records memories for them. And and just so happen to step on a platform that automatically begins playing memories that are vital to the plot. For Strange, the memory that pops up is that of a moment when Christine gave him a watch as a gift, a plot device that would be used later in the film. America Chavez steps on the platform and it dumps the scenario of the first time she used her multiverse jumping powers that accidentally sent her parents spiraling into apparent oblivion. It seems Chavez's multiverse jumping powers engaged during times of hyper stress, so to show this, the writers had a bee land on her hand. That's what set her off for the first time. A bee landing on her hand. I fucking facepalmed when I saw this. I just imagined the execs and filmmakers sitting at a round table discussing how they were going to give Chavez's story some background, and this is what they came up with. A bee. Hey, we need to give Chavez's backstory some drama. How do we do that? Make her responsible for her parents' disappearance with her powers. Give her some guilt and stuff. Well, how did she make them disappear? What scared her enough to use her powers for the first time? What if she's picking flowers and a bug makes her shit herself? Genius. Isn't it convenient that Strange and Chavez came across the store that could pop up their memories? And isn't it convenient that the memories that popped up were necessary for the story to progress? What if the memory that popped up for Strange was him plowing Christine instead? Pretty convenient that it wasn't anything embarrassing like that, eh? I couldn't believe what I was watching when this scene happened. Absolutely zero desire was had trying to get this information organically to the audience. Nope, instead an insanely lazy plot device was devised by the writers to shove this info into the audience's collective faces. Outrageously stupid character moments happen throughout the film and it's clear it's because of crappy, hastily decided upon rewrites. At one point after Scarlet Witch desecrates Kamartage, she has Wong tied up while she dream walks through another universe to find Chavez and strange, leaving the Darkhold actually sitting beside her. A surviving sorceress tells Wong that she's going to sacrifice herself to destroy it, and sure as shit, she does. Moments later, Wong immediately confesses to Wanda that the spells in the Darkhold are etched into stone on a fucking mountain after she starts torturing some of the surviving sorcerers in front of him in order to make him spill the beans. Cool, so Wong is aware that the Darkhold itself doesn't matter, but lets the sorcerers die for it without saying a word to stop her. Then Wanda tortures surviving sorcerers who were just lying on the ground, even though it was implied earlier that everyone there was dead. Guess they were just lying there because they were tired. Then when Wanda asks him to tell her how to get a hold of the spells again, instead of just saying, there isn't any way to get the spells, he tells her, you'll have to kill me, which tells her that there is another way to get a hold of them. What the just tell her that the book was the only way. What the actual fuck? Did this happen because, oh, I don't know, they needed the story to progress? So he basically sent that sorceress to her death five seconds ago for absolutely no reason. I'm sure an MCU stan will come up with an excuse for this stupidity. Maybe they'll tell me he had a vendetta against her or something. As far as bad writing goes, there's a true winner. The epic bait-and-switch cameo scene with the Illuminati. Marvel and Disney tried to generate as much hype as they could with the reveal of these characters in the trailers, and then pulled the rug out from underneath the audience by having them be completely irrelevant and unimportant. Disney and Marvel clearly are aware of what fans want, hence the fan casting of John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic, and they know people want to see the X-Men and Fantastic Four. So it's absurd to suggest it's people's own fault that they hyped it up for themselves. Marvel hyped this up. They want money. This is how you get more of it. This had the same feeling as the Quicksilver Ralph Bonner situation in WandaVision, where they had the same actor who played Quicksilver in the Fox X-Men universe reprise his role. But they were just kidding. It wasn't really him. He just looks like him. It's actually your fault you expect expected us to follow through with the X-Men introduction that we purposely set up to generate excitement. I'm just gonna fuck myself. Disney gaslights like a toxic X. Not to mention they have Doctor Strange basically shit all over Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four during his short interaction with him, making fun of the 
team and then followed up nicely with Reed getting annihilated by Wanda. This is writing that has no consideration whatsoever for what's to come. Want to talk about alternate versions done correctly versus how to do it completely wrong? Again, look no further than Strange's last movie appearance in Spider-Man No Way Home for how to do this right. To honor and respect those characters you're pulling in, instead of dropping them into a scene that's hastily written and then shitting all over them. And I'm pretty sure people are far more excited about the FF and X-Men entering the MCU than seeing alternate Captain Marvel and Peggy Carter, who yes is cool to see, but come on, let's be real. Yet the movie disposes of Reed, Black Bolt, and Xavier in embarrassing fashion while the ladies put up the longest fight. Okay. I try not to give credence to an agenda too much, but really? This looks suspiciously like Marvel crapping on its own legacy and the things people actually enjoy about its franchise, just to prop up characters that honestly, no one asked for. And as far as Multiverse of Madness goes, he isn't allowed to do much with said multiverse. There's a very, very short sequence where Chavez and Strange are blasting through multiple universes that looks absolutely terrific. But other than that, we spend most of the time in one universe where the craziest difference is people stop on green and go on red. Wow. Crazy. Utter madness, even. And man, does Cumberbatch do the best he can with what he has in this film? There are a few things these movies can't get wrong, and that would be casting. Well, besides Brie Larson. Elizabeth Olsen and Benedict Cumberbatch are in top form, which makes the story they have to deal with even more tragic. What a waste of incredible talent, both in the quality of the actress Olsen is, and utter awesomeness that is Scarlet Witch and the potential she had as a villain. Cumberbatch is Doctor Strange, much like Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. Not to suggest that Strange could be the lead of the MCU, though. The character himself works better as a supporting character, and well, like I said, he definitely feels like one despite his name being in the title. But something tells me that wasn't intentional. Rachel McAdams is fine. She's whatever. Xochitl Gomez is also very whatever. She's also fine. She's young, so I can't disparage her acting ability too much. It doesn't distract, but it's certainly not a highlight. Doctor Strange 2 is, unfortunately, Keanu Reeves taking a shit. It was almost torture revisiting some of these movies, and what's going to be worse is the second video where I watched some of the TV shows for the first time. Five years ago, I never would have thought I'd actively avoid watching an MCU-related project, and I avoided probably 75% of the TV shows alone. I want to thank Scentbird for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Part 2 of my Phase 4 Revisit. All television shows reviewed. GG's.